Good morning, Cross Point. Welcome to worship this morning. God has called us here. You are here. He knew you would be here. He has brought you here this morning. Um, and we want to sing to him as a family, as a church, uh, not only as Cross Point, but worldwide. Would you stand and sing with us? We have a new song that we're going to teach you this morning as our call to worship. And it really calls people from all places, all walks of life, whether you're coming here with joy or sorrow. Um, so we invite you to, if you'd like to just listen the first time through and join us in the second time, you may do that. Um, but please join us in worship. Women's ministry here at Cross Point Church, 
And on behalf of Cross Point, we'd like to welcome each of you here today. Um, it's been a busy holiday season, and we hope it was a wonderful time for each and every one of you. Um, but now it's time to get back to the routine. And so everything here at church, all the ministries will be starting up this week. So we'd like to make sure that you remember that and come back and get connected in one of our ministries. Um, also, we are looking forward to January 26th having a women's mini retreat here at the church. Our speaker will be Jill Ludlow, and she was here a couple years ago and is a dynamic speaker and has a great message to share with our women. So invite your friends and neighbors. Um, we will be selling tickets today out in the patio. They'll be out there for sale today and for the next couple weeks. So mark that on your calendar. And um, if you're new today, we'd like to welcome you. It's our pleasure to have you join us. We'd like to get to know you better and connect with you. If you fill out one of the information cards in the seat pocket in front of you, you can uh, put that in the offering plate, and we can get to know you better. Also, there's a hospitality room directly out the back. Please um, take a minute to stop by there so we can meet you personally and know how we can connect with you. So at this time, please step in the aisles. Um, greet one another, share the love of Christ, and uh, we're just glad to be together to worship him today.
can't separate Even if I run away Your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have no mercies for me every day Your love never fails are good. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, uh, our morning offering will be received. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all Searing loss 
the Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life I know that it is for the gift of life. God, we sing that song and we're reminded again that we're not worthy of that gift. It was my sin, it was our sins that put Jesus on the cross. And we're not worthy of that gift of life, but we're so grateful that you're a God of mercy and a God of grace, a God of salvation who acted to save his people. God, and we bless you for that this morning. We praise you for that, knowing that we are in relationship with you, not because we have brought anything to the table, not because we have accomplished anything, but because Jesus accomplished the work uh, on our behalf. We praise you that he paid that incredible penalty of death so that we could live. God, and we know that that's the way in which you work, that True life, abundant life only comes as we die, as we die to our sins, as we die to ourselves and allow you to fill us with goodness and grace and mercy and peace. And so God, we pray that you would do that this morning, that as we worship you, as we uh, spend time in your word, God, that you would take our emptiness and that you would fill it with you. God, that we would leave here this morning uh, with less of us and more of you in us uh, as individuals, uh, but also as a corporate body. God, that as we go back into our neighborhoods, into our workplaces for many uh, the first time in a couple of weeks, uh, God, that we would go back and people would see you in us, that they would hear you in us, that they would experience you in us. God, that you would use us as your hands and feet to be the true church, to show Jesus Christ, to make him famous and glorious. And so, God, we pray that you would do that work in our midst. We bless you, God, for the gift of Christmas and for the season that we're coming out of and for how we, that time that we can reflect 
on the miracle of the incarnation of Jesus uh, coming in the flesh, of God in the flesh. And we bless you for that, God. We thank you for that. We thank you uh, for your people, God, who responded to the movement in their hearts, God, to give. We know that Christmas has become so much about receiving, and yet your desire is that we would be a people who give, who give of our resources and time and our energies and our gifts and our hearts and our minds, that we would give all of ourselves to you. And God, we saw that in December as your people gave. Uh, and we bless you for that and we praise you for that and know that that is not anything that we could orchestrate. It's not anything that we can do on our own. And so God, we come to you as your people and we say thank you and we bless you and we praise you. God, we pray for those this morning who are entering into the new year with broken hearts. God, I think of the Yortzma family and our church who lost a, a husband and a dad and a grandpa and for many of us a friend this past week. God, we pray for your comfort and your peace. God, to fall upon that family in abundance. God, that as they, we have the memorial service this week, God, that you would use that time for the gospel message to go forward for the name of Jesus Christ to be proclaimed. We know that that was the heart of Dick. And so God, we pray uh, for that time and that service. We pray too for others in our body, God, I know who are hurting, who have lost loved ones, who have, been, have heard the words cancer, who have, God, been given uh, troubling news. And we pray that same comfort and peace, God, to fall upon them. And God, that you would go before us in this new year, that you would light the path. God, that we would in courage and boldness follow you wherever that leads us. God, that you would continue to shape us into the church that you want us to be. God, that in 2013, that we more and more can set aside our own agendas, our own ideas, our own even past experiences, God, and, and just keep seeking your face, seeking your will, seeking your purpose for us as your people. God, that's our greatest desire because in that you will be glorified. Not cross point, not us as individuals, but God, you will be glorified. You will be uh, made famous and that is our heart's desire. Amen. God, we pray that as we spend time in your word now, Lord God, that uh, your Holy Spirit would move, that God, you would uh, speak through me. Uh, God, in my weakness, be strong. And uh, my lack of clarity, God, I pray for that you would be clear um, God, your word says that your word will not go, it will not return a void. It will re not return empty. And we trust that. God, we, we claim that promise this morning. And so speak to your people through your word. And all God's people said, amen. 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 It's good to be here this morning, amen? amen. Beginning of uh, a new year, I have said uh, quite a few different times that the season that we're just coming out of really from beginning of November to the end of December is my favorite time of the year. Uh, I know it's many of yours as well. And uh, it seems like every year we come and I anticipate November 1 and, and I am excited and then I blink and it's January, right? <laughs> Whoa, we're in January already. And that happens, uh, seems like every year, but it's been a, a good, it was a good season here at Cross Point. So many things to praise the Lord for. Uh, you guys need to know these things. Um, uh, people are coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Last week, someone here received Christ for the first time, uh, and we need to praise the Lord for that, right? Um, and so, amen, yeah, that's huge. A couple weeks ago, same thing. Someone came to know Jesus for the first time. And, and that's not something that is orchestrated, right? That is the work of God in people's hearts. Um, and so we need to praise him for that. And in my prayer too, just uh, praise the Lord for uh, your faithfulness in giving uh, in December. I know our elders are uh, wanting you to know that. And, and we really praise God for that because again, that's not something that's orchestrated. And, and so uh, we're thankful to God uh, for the, the gifts as well and for the ministries that can go forth because of that. So good things happening around here. Uh, hallelujah. Well, uh, Pastor Tim started his sabbatical 
this past week. Uh, please pray for him. I mean, as a church, let's commit to be praying for him every single day. I know many of you are. If you're not, please join us in that. Uh, pray that God would renew him, uh, that God would refresh him. And as Pastor Tim seeks his face, I know he is anticipating hearing from the Lord. And so pray that uh, God would speak to him and that, and that he would hear him through his word, uh, through his people. Um, and uh, so hold him up in prayer. And then uh, while he's gone for the next three months, uh, we're going to start a series this morning and be in the series called The Good Life. Uh, and it's based on the Beatitudes. Who can tell me where the Beatitudes are found in Scripture? Matthew chapter 5, okay? So we're going to talk about the good life, and isn't that appropriate as we come out of Christmas and out of New Year's Day where many people are looking for the good life, right? At Christmas time for us as believers, uh, it is about the incarnation. It's about God himself coming in the flesh, right? The miracle of the birth of Jesus. But culture more and more is making that more difficult, right? Culture is saying it's not about, it doesn't have anything to do with God. It doesn't have anything to do with Jesus and, and the incarnation. It's about getting things, right? And so for so many people, Christmas is about looking for the good life through things, through, you know, a 60-inch flat-screen TV, right? If I just get this nice, huge, flat-screen TV on the wall of my house, I will have the good life. And come February, what is it, 3, I think, the Super Bowl, and I can watch the Super Bowl on this huge screen in my house, and then I will have the good life, right? So we, we look for it in that, or maybe it's uh, in clothes. If I just have the right clothes, if I... If I would have just gotten the right shirt or jacket at Christmas time and people will look at me differently, they'll think I'm hip and cool and, and then I, I, I can have the good life, right? Or um, maybe it's, uh, you know, the commercials uh, during the Christmas have new cars. Has anyone gotten a new car for Christmas? Have, has anyone actually ever had a car pulled up in their driveway with a big red bow on it on Christmas morning? Okay. Wouldn't that be the good life, right? Okay. People are looking for the good life in things. And then we come into New Year's Day and, and people are looking uh, for the good life in things that they're going to do in 2013. And so they, we set goals and, and that's not bad in and of itself, right? But we set goals. And if I just make, achieve this financial goal in 2013, I will have the good life. Or if I achieve these educational goals in 2013, I will have the good life. If I make this team in 2013, then I'm going to have the good life because people are going to think well of me, right? If I lose this much weight in 2013, right, and I have the right look, then I'm going to have the good life. Or if I get into the gym and pump just the right amount of weights and look like Pastor Brian, ugh, then I will have the good life, right? You're not supposed to laugh that loud. <laughs> A chuckle would be okay, right? We look for the good life in different things, and, and none of those things are bad in and of themselves, right? But we know that more and more in our society and our culture, we're pulled and we're directed and we're, we're, we're asked to change our minds and our thinking and to say that those things will give us the good life, and we know that that's not the case. The word of God tells us differently. And so we're going to spend uh, probably nine or ten weeks uh, during Pastor Tim's sabbatical looking at this theme, this topic, the good life, through the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. And so what is the good life? And I'm going to answer that. We're going to have the answer right away. The answer is that the good life is life in the life of God right? It is life in the life of God. But who has access to that life? Who really lives that life? And I believe that the Beatitudes help to bring clarity to that. And so open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to read the Beatitudes uh, this morning. And I want to throw out a challenge and ask you to work on memorizing 
chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And you have nine or ten weeks to do that, okay? And maybe as we go along, uh, we'll see who, who's doing that. But memorization of Scripture is important. I know the older I get, the harder it is for me to remember and to memorize. So it takes more effort and more work. But there is something about memorizing Scripture, okay? God's Word dwells in us, and it lives in us, and we meditate on it more. We think about it more as we work to memorize. So uh, I challenge you to commit this passage to memory. Um, But this morning, uh, it will be on the screen, and I will read it. So please stand and follow along as I read Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12. Now when he saw the crowds, that's Jesus they're talking about, Matthew's talking about, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. You can be seated. Anytime that we look at scripture, it is always important to look at the context, right? The context of scripture, and so just a, a little bit of setting a foundation for our series. I really believe that Jesus, um, when he uh, taught the Beatitudes to the crowds, uh, and, and the Beatitudes are, are the beginning of what is known as the Sermon on the Mount, that when Jesus taught that uh, Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, that he was already a couple of years into his public ministry. Um, It's at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, but in terms of chronology, I believe that it probably occurred uh, at least a couple years into his ministry. Jesus is already well known uh, as a rabbi, as a teacher. The crowds are coming to him in masses from all over the region. If you've been to Israel, they're coming from the south, they're coming from the east, they're coming from the north, they're coming from the west, they're coming from Jerusalem, they're coming from all over to hear this rabbi teach, to experience healing by Jesus of Nazareth. And so, in, in terms of Jesus' life, I think it's already a couple of years into his public ministry. In terms of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew has several themes that he develops uh, through his Gospel, and one of those things is the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And for some of us over the last three months from September through December, on Sunday nights, we spent time kind of unpackaging what is the kingdom of heaven, what is the kingdom of God. Um, and, And so we don't have a lot of time to delve into that, but one of the themes of Matthew is the kingdom of God that is present in the person of Jesus, that the kingdom of the heavens God's heavenly rule, his heavenly reign, broke into time and space in the person of Jesus Christ. That rule is not an oppressive rule, it is a redemptive rule. It is a rule that brings redemption and healing and forgiveness and life and light to darkness. And so, one of the things that Matthew does in his gospel in terms of Jesus is he shows how Jesus taught about the kingdom of heaven, about this heavenly rule that has come to the earth through him. He taught it, he preached it in the synagogues. He illustrated it through his parables. If you read the Gospel of Matthew, you will see that so many of his parables start with the kingdom of heaven is like, right? 
Jesus illustrates what the kingdom is about, what it is like through his parables, and he demonstrated what the kingdom is about through his actions, through those healings, through delivering men and women uh, from demon possession, through forgiveness of sins, through loving people. That is the kingdom, the rule of God brought to this earth, lived through Jesus. And so when we look at the Beatitudes for the next nine or 10 weeks, we want to look at them in the context of that understanding of kingdom and the kingdom being lived out through Jesus Christ. And so we're going to do that, and as we do that, we're going to look at two questions uh, for every beatitude. We're going to look at these two questions. To whom is the kingdom of heavens available? Is Michelle anywhere around here? Michelle Winia? She's probably out there. She's on the praise team. She'd be proud of me for how I said that. To whom is the kingdom of heaven available? The Beatitudes answer those, that question. The second question is, how are those who have entered into that life, that kingdom life, how are they called to live? And so the Beatitudes are a description of the Christian life. They are a description of how we as followers of Jesus Christ are called to live. And immediately as we, even this morning, start with the first beatitude, poor in spirit, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, we will immediately realize that we cannot do that on our own. That it is only through the power of the Holy Spirit living in us and through us that we are able to live into what it means to be poor in spirit. And ones who mourn and ones who uh, are meek and on and on and on. And so the questions are, to whom is the kingdom of heaven available? And how are those who have entered into that kingdom living to live? Okay, so those are the things that we're going to look at. And this morning, as I mentioned, we're going to start with the first beatitude found in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And if, you'll, if you have your Bibles open, you will notice that every beatitude starts with this word. What's the word? Blessed, blessed right? Or blessed, okay? Blessed. And we need to kind of understand what that means before we can even get to poor in spirit. And so what, what this word does not mean is God bless the sick, or God bless the food, or God bless the children. In the Greek language, there are two words that we translate into English as blessed or blessed, okay? One of those words means exactly what I was just saying. It was God bless the children, bless the food, bless uh, Michelle, bless so-and-so, okay? And so it's a, a person or a thing that we are asking God to bless, and there's an anticipation of receiving that blessing, okay? That's, that is not what this word is about. This word comes from the Greek word makari, makarios, makarios, and it really means happiness that already exists, Rejoicing that is already existent, okay? It's a, it's a state of spirituality, happiness that, is, that already exists. So when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, he's saying, this person is already happy. That he's in the state of spiritual joy because he's poor in spirit, okay? Does that make sense? Let me, uh, let me give a couple of illustrations that might help to clarify that. There's someone in our church who, whenever you ask him how he is doing, his response is, I'm blessed. How are you doing, so-and-so? I'm blessed. He's blessed. He's already in the state of joy, in the state of happiness, because he sees God's blessing in his lives. He knows that God provides for him. He knows that God has has delivered him from sin and death. He knows that God has done this miracle of regeneration in his life. And so his response is, I'm blessed. I'm already in this state of happiness because of what God has done on my behalf, okay? Another illustration might be this. What if uh, uh, you or I had um, a rich uncle, we'll say, okay, who uh, loved us dearly and uh, put you or I into uh, his will, and we become the inheritors of his wealthy estate. But he's only 50 years old when he puts us into that will. At, 
if people came to us, they would say, Brian is already in this happy state because he knows that he is the, in, the, the, inheritor, the inheritor of this estate. I'm already happy. I don't have to wait 20 years until my rich uncle passes away to, to have that joy. It's, an, it's a state of happiness and joy that already exists, okay? So Jesus, when he talks about the Beatitudes, he's saying, he's saying this person Blessed are you who are poor in spirit. You are already in the state of of happiness, in the state of joy, in the state of rejoicing because of what I have done in you, okay? So that is uh, what that word blessed means and that has an impact on how we understand these beatitudes. And so Jesus says, blessed are you poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful and so on and so forth. Now, let's get to this phrase, poor in spirit. We said that we're going to answer two questions. To whom is the kingdom of heaven available? The answer is to the poor in spirit. And how are those who have entered into that life, into that kingdom living, into relationship with God through Jesus Christ, how are those people to live their lives? And the answer is, by being poor in spirit. We're done. <laughs> okay, you've got the answers. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, kind of try to understand what does that mean? What, so let's start with that question. To whom is the kingdom of heaven available? Jesus, when he starts these beatitudes, the crowds have gathered around them. And there's, there's debate about who's, who's the, who makes up that crowd. Is it just Jesus' disciples or is it other people as well? I tend to think that it is other people as well. I think it was a large crowd. And at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, at the end of Matthew chapter seven, I think it, 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 it says that. The crowds were amazed at how he taught with authority, okay? So I think it was more than just the disciples. And if you look at the end of chapter four, who are the people that are making up the crowds, okay? This, I think, tells us who maybe Jesus is talking about. At the end of chapter four, it kind of gives this laundry list of the people that would come to Jesus. Those who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed. And guess what? He healed them. The rule of God, the rule of God's kingdom has come through Jesus, through the presence of Jesus, and he touched them, and he healed them, okay? And I think those, those are the people that are making up the crowd that Jesus is talking to in addition to his disciples. And so, who are the poor in spirit? We might say it's the people with no religious background, maybe it's the people with no religious pedigree, no religious influence, Maybe they are in such a deplorable condition, spiritually speaking, that they themselves could not even imagine that God could love them, that God could forgive them. They are in such a deplorable condition, spiritually speaking, that the religious people, and if we're honest, that means sometimes you and I, we might look at them and say, there is no way in the world that God could breathe his life into them and bring spiritual life. We might even look at people like that. This past week, uh, I went to the Rose Parade. Did anyone else go to the Rose Parade? Okay. I just want to let it be known that that's not always my favorite thing to do. I, when, New Year's Day for me uh, is waking up, you know, maybe 6.30 or 7, cup of coffee in the warmth of my house, turn on the parade at eight, have pancakes and lots of bacon and good food, right? And, and then as soon as the parade is done, it's the first football game, right? And then football goes through most of the day. That for me is New Year's Day. But we had some, some visitors, some uh, family from out of town and they wanted to experience the Rose Parade and so we went and actually it was, it was, it was quite good. I was, uh, I was pleasantly surprised. If you've been to the Rose Parade, and this was my third time in my life doing it, um, you will know that before the parade starts, there are all kinds of people that walk up and down the street, okay? The street is open, and, and you see all different kinds of people. And this past uh, uh, week, 
there was uh, some, some people that were walking carrying signs, and some of them you could see were uh, Christians, and, and the signs were about God's love, John three sixteen, about God's grace and his mercy and forgiveness in Jesus Christ, and, and, and you could look at them and, and know that, that they are believers. Um, but there was some other guys, uh, probably a group of four or five guys that carried big signs as well. And their signs read things like, God kills. Their signs read, God is evil. That God is responsible for what happened on November 11. And in the flesh, right, if we're really, really honest with ourselves, we have to admit that when we see people like that, we think to ourselves, man, that person is so far from God, right? That person is, is on the road to you know where, right? Holy cow, man, I can't imagine carrying that sign. Wow, right? And so we in our minds think that person has no chance to be brought into God's kingdom, into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. But the message of the Beatitudes and the, the message of this first Beatitude, I believe, is Jesus is saying, those ex- are exactly the people that the kingdom of heaven is available to. Because when the kingdom of God, the rule of God, comes through me and I give them life, They are in the kingdom, right? And so when Jesus touches, when Jesus heals, when Jesus redeems, that is who the kingdom is available to. And the message of the Beatitudes is who we think of as that might be, uh, uh, um, you know, saved or who could enter into kingdom living is so very different than what I think Jesus says. And in the time of Jesus, that crowd that made up Uh, the people around him, they would have been looked down upon. They would have been looked down upon by the people, the paralyzed, the the ones with diseases, leprosy, the demon-possessed. The people would have said, no way is the kingdom available to them. They're the outcasts of society. And the message of this beatitude is Jesus is turning that thinking upside down and he is saying, no, my kingdom is different than that. Those who are viewed as last in the eyes of the world are first in my kingdom. Now, let's look at uh, an example in Scripture. Turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Luke chapter 7. Luke 7, beginning at verse 36. I think this is a great illustration of what Jesus is teaching in this beatitude. A contrast between a religious person and a, quote, sinner. I'm going to start reading at verse 36. You can follow along. Now one day, now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus. A Pharisee was a religious leader in the time of Jesus. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, now, This is, I think, what we do sometimes, okay? Put yourself in his shoes. He's thinking this. If this man were truly a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. She is a sinner. The kingdom is not available to her. He's thinking to himself. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii. A denarius was a day's wages, so it's 500 days' wages. And the other, 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman. Now, put put yourself in the text, right? Jesus is now looking at the woman, but he's talking to the Pharisee. Do you see this woman? I came into your house. 
You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The rule of God comes and brings redemption and life to this woman. Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this that, who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You have been reconciled to my father, right? That's what go in peace means there. Go in peace. So here I think you have a picture right, of who the world and even religious people would say, do not, this person does not have any chance to be a part of God's kingdom. She is a sinner. If he just knew who was touching him, right, and Jesus flips that on his head, on its head, and he says, this is exactly who my kingdom is for, People who come to me broken, people who come to me empty, people who realize that they are nothing without me. This is who this woman is. And he says to Simon the Pharisee, Simon, I've come into your house and you didn't, you didn't serve me. You didn't wash my feet. You were too high for that, Simon. But she hasn't stopped crying and with her tears washing my feet since the moment I got here. Simon, you didn't anoint my head. You didn't think me enough of me to do that, but she has never stopped. She has not stopped pouring perfume on my feet. And in that, we see that well, who she maybe thought that Jesus was, that she knew he was something special, somebody special, maybe even a king, the Messiah. She's anointing him. Simon, you missed it completely. Therefore, her sins are forgiven, and I'm gonna give her life. The kingdom of heaven The rule of God, the redemptive rule of God comes down and brings her life. That is what this beatitude is about. That is what it looks like to be poor in spirit, to come to Jesus empty, to come to him with nothing, to come to him knowing that without him we are nothing that we don't have a chance, but as we come to him, he, the rule of heaven enters our lives and he changes us through the work of the Holy Spirit and he breathes life into us and the very people that we look at and say, no way, I can't imagine God breathing life into them, God says, oh, you watch me. You watch me. Brian, you think I can't breathe life into those guys carrying those signs? You watch me. You watch what I can do and I wanna use you And I want to use you, and I want to use you to be my voice, and I want to use you to be my healing hand, and I want to use you to be love to them. They maybe haven't ever seen love, and I want you to love them. Last night at our dinner table, we were talking about our neighbors and talking about how how are they going to know who Jesus Christ is? Well, it's got to be us. We have other neighbors who are believers too. It has to be us, and it has to be them. God wants to use us, right? That is the kingdom of heaven. Being poor in spirit is seeing who God, who God brings into his kingdom. It's, it's the people carrying the signs. It's the woman. It's those who come to him broken and empty, knowing that they need him for life. And so I picture Jesus on this mount, and some of us were there, right, in, in Israel this past summer, uh, I picture him there and I picture the crowds and around him, gathering around him and and I picture him looking into the crowd and maybe seeing a guy named Moses, right? A popular Hebrew name. A guy named Moses who was demon possessed and Jesus touched him and Jesus healed him and Jesus called that demon out of him. And I see Jesus looking at Moses and saying, Moses, blessed are you who is poor in spirit, and the kingdom of heaven belongs to you, Moses. Or take any name, right? Arnie. (laughs) Maybe there was some guy named Arnie in the crowd, right? Arnie, blessed are you. The kingdom of heaven belongs to you. Okay? Maybe you're here this morning And you're thinking to yourself, I am so far from God. There's no way in the world that God could ever love me. 
The things that I've done in my life would never allow God to love me or to forgive me or to breathe his life into me. I have a word for you this morning. The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Amen? If you are here this morning and that is what you are thinking or believing, know that God has brought you here this morning for a purpose, that you are not here by accident because he wants to tell you and he wants to share with you and he wants to bring healing and life to you. He wants to bring the rule of God, that redemptive rule into your life to redeem you from darkness and bring you into the kingdom of the Son where there is forgiveness and life and redemption. And so to whom... Does the kingdom belong? It's the poor in spirit. It's those who come empty and who are filled with the grace of God. The second question that I think this beatitude addresses is, how are those who have entered into that life? How are those who have said yes to Jesus? How are we to live Right, and we said the Beatitudes are a description of the Christian character. How are we to live? Well, let me start by telling you, and the answer is poor in spirit, right? What does that not look like? Let me tell you what that does not mean, and then we'll get to what that looks like. Poor in spirit is not one who is lacking in courage or boldness. I was reading as I was studying this week about someone who read the Beatitudes and said, I cannot be like that. I cannot be merciful. That is not who God has created me to be. I cannot be poor in spirit because his framework of thinking was wimpiness, right? He's saying that's not who God has created me to be. That is not what poor in spirit means. Poor in spirit does not mean weak. It does not mean lacking in courage or boldness. Peter and Paul, apostles of Jesus Christ, the most bold people that we have in scripture were poor in spirit. Like that song said, we will not boast in anything except Jesus Christ, right? That is what it means to be poor in spirit. And Peter and Paul and other apostles were great examples of that. Poor in spirit does not mean that we have to suppress our personality or go and live in a monastery somewhere and escape from the world around us. That is not what it means to be poor in spirit. It does not mean that we have to compel ourselves out of our own strength and out of our own will to to sacrifice everything. God does not call everyone to do that. That does not necessarily mean what it means to be poor in spirit. And so what does it mean to be poor in spirit? I believe this beatitude addresses our attitude about ourselves. This beatitude addresses our attitude about what we think of ourselves. What do you feel, what do I feel when we stand face to face with God? If you wanna know if you are poor in spirit, then we have to begin to imagine contemplate standing and being in the presence of God. How do I really honestly feel about myself as I think of myself in terms of God and being in his presence? Contemplate, think about standing before him. Look at him. Don't stop looking at him because the more that we look at him, the more helpless we feel by ourselves, the more we realize we need him and we are driven to complete dependence upon him, right? Turn uh, in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is kind of right in the middle, if you have your Bible, Isaiah chapter six. Kind of Psalms is the middle, and then it's a little after that. Isaiah chapter six. Isaiah 6, Isaiah is a prophet. God gives him a vision. He sees God seated on his throne, and the, and the text uses words high and exalted, okay? Imagine yourself, you're Isaiah, and you're in the presence of God, okay? Even if you have to close your eyes, just listen. You see the Lord seated on his throne, high and exalted. The train of his robe fills the temple, 
Above him are these angelic beings. They're seraphs. And they're, they have six wings. And two wings they cover their faces because they can't bear to look at the, the almighty God. With two they cover their feet. And with two they're flying. And what are they saying to one another? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. In the presence of God, they can do nothing but worship him because of who he is. And so being poor in spirit is having a right understanding of who God is in relationship to us. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. And what does Isaiah say? He says, woe to me, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. And if I can translate, he's saying, I'm a sinner. And I live among a people of unclean lips. I live amongst a sinful people. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. He knows that he's in the presence of his creator. He knows he's in the presence of the King. And being poor in spirit is understanding who God is. His holiness, his righteousness, his majesty. That we are in awe of who he is and that we understand that apart from him, we are helpless. We understand our utter nothingness without him. And that drives us to complete dependence upon who, dependence upon him for everything. For everything that we have, for everything that we need, for who we are. In Isaiah 57 verse 15, God says, I am this high and lofty one. Again, listen to those words. Let them sink in. Who is God? He's the high and lofty one. He who lives forever. He's eternal. His name is holy. I, I say to Pastor Tim sometimes, do you ever notice that we sing, when we sing as a congregation about the holiness of God, whether it's the Revelation song, whether it's holy, 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 the old hymn, it doesn't matter. When we sing about the holiness of God, something happens in here. It's not because the song is cool. It's because we are brought into the presence of God and we know and we understand his holiness and his, and his grandeur and who we are in his presence. And here and Isaiah says, I live forever. My name is holy. I live in a high and holy place. But check this out. But I also am with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit. To revive the spirit of the lowly. To revive the heart of the contrite. God wants to breathe his life into us, right? So who, who, to whom is the kingdom available? It's to those that God breathes life into. How does he want us to live? As people who are always eager for the life of God to be breathed into us every single day. And that happens as we begin to understand who he is and who we are and our complete and under dependence upon him. But in our culture, you guys, it is so hard. It is so hard to be dependent upon God. And so we have to keep working at that, and that's God's desire for us. Know who I am. Know who I am and know who you are in relationship to me. And let that bring you to me. Let that bring you to the cross every single day to the cross of Jesus Christ. Realize your utter dependence on me. And that's the beauty of us coming to the table this morning, is it reminds us of our need. The table, the, the elements of, of bread and juice remind us of the sacrifice that he made for us, and it reminds us of our need for him. And so the meal nourishes us. We come to him empty again, cracked vessels, and we say, fill us, God, with your goodness. Fill us with your mercy. Fill us with your grace. So being poor in spirit is having a complete absence of pride and self-sufficiency and self-assurance. And it is a complete and utter dependence upon God for everything. Just like the hymn, the old rugged cross says, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling, right? Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. God desires us to be in his presence. This, starting this week as a staff, we're gonna be going through the book that's called The Presence-Based Church. I believe that God's desire for us as a church, I know this is Pastor Tim's heart, is that we would be a church that wants nothing more than to be in the presence of God. Because when we spend time in the presence of God, he changes us into who he wants us to be. So being poor in spirit 
is the foundation for entry into the kingdom and it's possible only through the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. And being poor in spirit is the superstructure for fulfillment of life in that kingdom, right? If we want the good life, it's not about things and it's not about how we look and it's not about what we do, but it's about being in the presence of God and letting his life live through us. And so I have a question for you this morning. Does this beatitude describe you? If so, then I believe that God has you right where he wants you. Empty so that he can fill you. Broken so that we will depend upon him for all things. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing your kingdom and your rule into our lives. King Jesus, forgive us for when we don't submit to that rule as you desire us to. Forgive us for when we depend upon ourselves. Forgiveness for when we are assured in our own strength. God, forgive us. Teach us to be poor in spirit. Teach us to be like Jesus. The greatest example of what it means to be poor in spirit who in obedience and humility gave up his position and glory and in obedience and humility went to the cross. Teach us to be like Jesus. Teach us to have the same attitude as Jesus. As we come to the table, Father, we pray that you would fill us. As you host this table, as we spiritually drink Jesus Christ, fill us. God, fill us and strengthen us. May we leave here different because we have had a meal with our creator, with our savior, with our redeemer, Jesus Christ. So God, keep doing a work amongst us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. It is a great privilege every month to come to this table, this table that reminds us how we are to live, this table that reminds us of why it is possible, how it is possible that we can be poor in spirit, that it is only uh, because of what Jesus accomplished, right? So this table takes us back to the cross. It reminds us of Jesus' broken body and his shed blood that brought us into relationship with the Father. This table is also, it's a proclamation, right? It's the gospel message. This table is the gospel message and it, it, it reminds us that it is only through the broken body and through the blood of Jesus that we can come into relationship with the Father. And so who is this table for? It's for those who have said yes to Jesus Christ. And maybe you've said yes just this morning. Then this table is for you. This table is for all those who come empty. Jesus, like the woman who come empty, worshiping him, knowing that we need his love and we need his grace and we need his forgiveness. And so the table is for those like that as well. But it's interesting to me too as we study in scripture the communion table, it's also a, a covenant family meal. And as part of that covenant family meal, we commit ourselves to living again for him. And so this morning as you come forward and you take the elements, know that it's, uh, it's, a, it's a remembrance certainly, but it's more than that. It's a proclamation of Jesus' work in our lives and it's a, it's a commitment, it's a recommitment to live for him. It's saying, here's my life again, God, and I give it to you as an offering of praise and worship and do with it what you will, King Jesus. And so the elders are gonna come forward if you guys would do that and, and we're gonna have stations up here in the front uh, where you can come and get the juice and the, and the bread and there's uh, other wafers up here if you need those. Um, if you are unable to come forward, just raise your hand and one of the elders will find you and bring the elements to you and then hold on to them and we'll take them as a family um, after everyone has uh, returned to their seats. And so elders, please come forward.
fall at your feet. I will fall at your feet. And I will worship you Song. Amen. Amen. When Jesus was with his disciples shortly before he went to the cross, he had a powerful meal with them called the Passover. And it reminded the disciples and it reminded all Jews of God's saving grace that he redeemed them, that he brought them from a land of slavery, a life of slavery, into freedom and into a new relationship with him. And Jesus, having that meal with the disciples, and he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks to his father for it. And he said to his disciples, this bread is my body, broken for you, By faith, you will no longer be a slave to sin. By faith, you will find freedom in me. You will find the good life in me. So, family of God, take this bread and in faith, eat it, believing that Jesus' body was broken for a complete forgiveness of all of our sins.
he took a cup at that same meal and we've said before that there were multiple times during the meal when they would take a, a cup, but he took the cup called the cup of redemption, an especially significant cup. And he held it and he gave thanks and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. My blood is going to save you. My blood, not the blood of sheep, not the blood of goats, but my blood will bring you true life. So people of God, in faith, drink this morning, believing that it is only by the blood in the broken body of Jesus Christ that we have forgiveness of sins. And all God's people said, amen. amen. We're gonna continue our uh, time of worship uh, in song, and while we're singing that song, the deacons are gonna come and take a, an offering. It goes for our benevolence fund. That fund helps uh, people in this family that, that need uh, financial assistance uh, in lots of different ways, uh, but also helps uh, bless our community. Our deacons do an incredible work in our community, and so uh, give as God leads you uh, for this offering. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing with the
never before Oh my soul I worship your holy name Yes I will worship your holy name Lord I worship your Thank you, praise team, for bringing us into the presence of our holy God. Good to be here uh, the first Sunday of 2013, amen? Look forward to uh, what God has for us this year. Um, Keep praying. If you're a visitor here this morning, uh, we are excited to meet you, to get to know you. And right through these doors and to my left is a hospitality room. Please find your way over there. We have wonderful people there that are anxious to greet you and to get to know you. Uh, Prayer team, if you could come forward. If you need uh, prayer for anything, uh, healing, um, encouragement, uh, maybe you said yes to Jesus for the first time this morning. We want to know that. And so we have a prayer partners up here that are willing uh, to pray with you and please find your way forward. Uh, Receive God's blessing as we go out of this place and back into our workplaces and our schools and our neighborhoods. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his glorious face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you, his glorious and bright and amazing face, and may it give you peace in abundance. Amen and amen. God bless all of you. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your Lord, I worship your holy name. Yes, I will worship your holy name. Lord, I worship your holy name. 